lectures, which is going to be by Greg White of the School of Sport and Exercise Science. Greg was born in 1967. He did his first degree at Brunel before moving to the States to do a master's in human performance at Frostburg State University. He then did his PhD at St. George's Hospital Medical School, part of the University of Wolverhampton. Greg joined us in 2005. Um, his previous positions included the Director of Research at the British Olympic Association and Director of Sports Science and Research at the English Institute of Sport. He was awarded a chair in Applied um, Sport and Exercise Science in recognition of an exceptional output which now totals more than 100 publications, research publications and books. Greg's expertise is widely recognised and sought by other organisations and bodies and he holds a number of positions, just a few of which include he is a member of the UK Sport Research Advisory Group, he is a member of the College of America sorry, the American College of Sports Medicine. He is the chair of the scientific committee for the 2012 Pre-Olympic Conference, which is obviously quite a big event, and he holds the position of chair of a charity, the um, Cardiac Risk for the Young. Greg's expertise, though, isn't totally theoretical. He is a practitioner as well. As many of you will know, Greg was an international modern tennis athlete. He represented Britain at two Olympic Games. He won a bronze in the Europeans and a silver in the World Championships. He has continued to act as a consultant physiologist, training other sportsmen to help improve their performance in a wide range of Olympic events and professional sports. But perhaps he's most widely known more recently <coughs> some well-known amateurs get into shape for various tasks such as walking up a mountain, skiing the channel and uh, swimming on the Thames. We're joined tonight by Greg's parents and by Penny and three children, so welcome to you. But before I hand you over to Greg, uh, the new Vice-Chancellor, not the new, new Vice-Chancellor, <laughs> Nigel Weather would like to say a few words. Nigel. considerable weight on inaugural lectures within a university or within our university uh, because I think it actually goes to the very heart of what we are as a university and I'd like to give you sort of three reasons for that. Um, the currency of a university I think is, is knowledge. Uh, we create it, we explore it, we exchange it, we transfer it, we work with it. It's our currency. And as I think Leo Tolstoy said, all knowledge is but the bringing of the essence of life under the laws of reason. And I think when we're researching, we're actually constantly trying to understand the essence of life. Why are things as they are? Why do we behave as we do? Why are things as they are? And I think an inaugural lecture really is about playing with knowledge, if I can use that word, because I'm sure Greg will agree, and many of my colleagues will agree, that actually it is fun with this thing, uh, knowledge. And the inaugural lecture gives us a great opportunity to share the knowledge that Greg has created, challenged, tested with a wider audience. The second reason why I think the inaugural lecture is so important goes really a long way back to the great philosophers, Plato, Socrates, Archimedes, and they really believed that in order for the population to be able to make decisions about their own destiny, their own society, they needed to participate in wider open forums where they were, broadly speaking, educated about things that they don't necessarily meet on their day-to-day, -day, uh, in their day-to-day -day lives. And again, I like that because again, it goes back to the very core of what is a university. And I'm sure in the next hour, you know, we're going to hear things that we've not heard before.
trying to engage with thoughts, with challenges that we're not normally confronted with. And I really do believe we go right to the very core of what we are as a university, right back to those great philosophers, uh, Plato, Socrates, Archimedes, and others. And the third, which is probably as good a reason as any to hold an inaugural lecture, is that it's a celebration. It's fun. We're celebrating Greg's achievement. We're celebrating the achievement of the school and the faculty and the university of actually an individual working within the university who has achieved the very highest level and the award of a personal chair. So it's a good excuse to have a good celebration and, uh, and I'm sure afterwards colleagues will get together, chat and congratulate Greg. So I'd like to finish by just sending my personal also on behalf of the university. Congratulations on the award of the chair. Uh, and I'm personally, I'm sure everyone here is very much looking forward to your inaugural lecture. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very kind introduction. Just if you're any doubt, if you want to become dean, that's how you become dean. I'm remembering someone's CV better than actually I can remember it myself. It's incredibly impressive, no doubt about that. Uh, I hope you're going to be entertained today. Uh, it's usually entertaining, not always the good things, but uh, we'll, we'll see where we can go. Exercise versus sport, good versus evil. What I'm going to try and give you is a, just a, a, a chronological approach, of, a, a, I guess, of my history through research, uh, and give you some ideas why I think that we've moved to this position where actually Exercise, the caveat this talk un undoubtedly is the fact that exercise is fundamentally good for health without any shadow of doubt. I don't think we can argue against that. But the key question is, is when exercise becomes sport uh, and when that potential dose relationship response moves from a positive into a plateau, a negative in terms of health. And what I'm going to try and do is convince you of that. Uh, the hope is actually when you come out of this that you won't be convinced, but at least we'll have explored it as we go along. So just to say the background, these are some very young shots of me. Um, you're right, I was devastatingly handsome as a child. Uh, and what, this is what sport has done to me. So uh, I, I was, without any shadow of doubt, fortunate enough to, to compete for my country uh, over a, a great many years in, in an incredible sport, Montan Tatron, uh, which we've been incredibly successful at uh, in, in Olympic Games in Olympic history. Uh, and also World Championship and, and European Championship. So it, it's, it's definitely a sport to watch, and I would certainly uh, get you to watch it uh, this coming Olympic Games in 2012. It's going to be a very special event in Greenwich Park. So it, it just gives you an idea that, to some extent, I'm not talking out of experience. Uh, I, I spent um, somewhere in the region of about 17 years in the league sport. Uh, my mum and dad are here. My dad used to take me down to swim training when I was six. My first competitive swim race was at six years of age. Uh, and then from there, I probably spent up to, in the region of 35 to 40 hours a week training uh, every week of the year, uh, every year of my life, up to the age of about 34. Uh, and, and that's really to give you some context in terms of the dedication that's required to become an Olympian. But also the backdrop of that is just to, to take us away from this concept of exercise. This is not 150 minutes of moderate intensity activity in a week. This is 35 hours of utterly arduous exercise on a continual basis across a lifetime. And the key issue around that is whether that is beneficial for health versus that of exercise. These are some of the guys I've been fortunate enough to, to not only uh, have been an athlete myself, I, I then became the chair of the BI Athletes Commission. Uh, we were the last commission actually to vote on the bylaw, the doping bylaw for the, for the BOI and whether we should have a life ban. If anyone's any doubt, we should definitely have a life ban. And those cheats that decide to take drugs in sport should be banned for life. Uh, unfortunately, in about three months' time, CAS are going to overturn that. So we will see the return of cheats back into the Olympics, uh, Olympic arena. But up to this point in time, I think that the BOI has actually represented what elite sport is about. Uh, and it still resides in the ethic of sport and the ethic of Olympism. Let me give you an idea about where we are pushing our limits and what really interests me. These days, though, performance is not simply about speed or power. Matthew Bright, oh, Bono finished! Bono finished! In the last 20 years, that difference.
difference between winning an Olympic medal and losing has become smaller and smaller. What we know in a vast number of sports is that we're actually moving towards the limits of human performance. As we move closer towards those limits, we are stressing the human to their absolute limit. Oh, couldn't have been any closer, could it? So how we support our athletes has to be much more focused and much higher quality in order to make the best of a small number. That for me beautifully encapsulates what sports science is about. Is that what we are doing is giving a shortcut to elite performance. But at the same time, it also tells us where we are, that we've now evolved to this position where we are pushing humans to their absolute limit. How do we know that? We, we, we've taken a whole host of areas. And, and this is what sports science now looks like. It, it's, it's this incredibly complex socio-biological model. It's, it's the combination of a whole different uh, range of areas. This was a model that, that uh, appeared some years ago, but actually very rarely appeared in real life. It was the concept of what sports science should be. That has now evolved to that point. Uh, and, and when I uh, joined the English Institute of Sport uh, back in 2004, uh, it, that was the, the model we really based the English Institute of Sport around. The predecessor to that, though, was the British Olympic Medical Centre, now the Olympic Medical Institute, which led into this model. But what it showed you is the complexity of what's going on with athletes now. No longer is it simply turning up on a Wednesday evening uh, and just having a run around the track and then hoping that you're going to uh, get selected for the, the Olympic team. It's a complex science where what we're now trying to do is, is drag out the absolute limits of individuals' performance with a whole range of, of science and technology. And this was some work that, uh, that I published some time ago now but with, with Alan Neville. And this really got to the heart of what we are talking about in the sense that this was what limits of human performance were about. On the top line is men, sorry, on the top line is uh, running, on the, the lower line is swimming. Uh, we get, we've actually done this for all linear endurance events and the, the model is exactly the same. Uh, there was a, a one, here's a piece of advice for, for a new researcher, and that is the assumption that uh, impact factor of a journal makes a difference to the quality of the research. Uh, because there was a wonderful paper uh, published by a, a, a good friend of mine, uh, and uh, recently departed, but Brian Whip, who published data looking at the 100 metre world record for men and women, and using a linear regression model showed that actually at some stage in the future, in fact in 2056, women would run as fast as men using a linear model. Now that's problematic in, in, a, in a biologic model because what that means is that sometime in the past, humans were non-ambulatory, which to be fair, you look at some kids today and you would believe them. Uh, but what it, also, what it also suggests is actually sometime in the future, humans will run as fast as the speed of light. Uh, and bolts quick, but they ain't that quick. And so therefore that linear model doesn't work. And yet that was published, that work was published in Nature. Uh, but I read that work and you realise actually that was rubbish. I mean it was utter rubbish and yet it was in nature. And so what we did is we, we effectively questioned that. Uh, interesting enough nature wouldn't publish this work. Uh, which, is, which is always a good sign actually. Uh, because they don't like to admit they're wrong. And so what we did is we published the, the, the top one in MSSE and, together with an editorial with Brian. We had a discussion within that. But what we show here is one of two things. Number one is that there was a period of time in world record performances when they accelerated very rapidly. And that time of acceleration was around the 50s, 60s and 70s, but particularly in the 60s and 70s. There were technological advances. We moved from red bra or astro uh, surfaces to mondo surfaces on the track, for example. Anti-wave lane ropes in the pool at certain depths, at certain temperatures, which all accelerated time. There was the advancement in sports science and sports medicine, which was absolutely fundamental to the uh, advancement of performance at that time. And then, of course, notwithstanding our good old friend, pharmacology, uh, that the systematic and institutionalized doping, particularly in the Eastern Bloc at that time, made for these massive gains in, in performance. The other interesting aspect, though, is the fact that well, if you take a look at these, all of these across the events, across distances, we see a plateau in, in performance. In other words, humans are starting to reach their limit for what we can actually drive out of them. And that is true for all distances. On each of those graphs, you've got an upper graph and a lower graph. The upper graph is men, the lower graph is women. Women will never run, or swim, or cycle, or row as fast as men. That's the fact of it, and there are a whole host of reasons for that, and we can talk about that. Uh, but the fundamental issue is that they won't. What's interesting, though, when you take a look at this data, is that the difference between men and women equates to around about 
irrespective of distance, irrespective of modality, irrespective of discipline within that modality. So you can take a 50 meter freestyle or you can take the marathon. The difference between men and women is 10%, which is an intriguing difference across all of those areas. So it, it, it's, it's, it's an intriguing area in the sense that I look at this and think, what is it that limits performance? And if we are reaching the limits of human performance, surely we're reaching the limits of human health. And so to that, and given that the, the performance is integrative, uh, I haven't mentioned genetics in here. Some of you may know my thoughts on genetics, but the concept that we have a performance gene is nonsense. Uh, it is an incredibly multifactorial approach in terms of performance itself. It is multi-genetic, in other words. And I think the concept that we can find a single gene to express uh, performance it is, uh, is a long way off and it will never happen because it is multi-genetic. But what we know is that there are multi-systems involved, this integrative physiology approach to performance. And so therefore, the potential for injury stroke harm is equal across those systems. It's not just on one system, it's across those systems. And so what I'm going to try and do now is just give you a little bit of a, a chronological approach to the work that we've done to demonstrate some of those relationships. And this is where we started. Uh, the athlete's heart. This is a modified version. Uh, prior to this was the Moore and Roth hypothesis, published in 1975, which differentiated strength and uh, endurance training. We now know that that probably isn't true. Uh, this, this is later work that we did, and yet this is now outdated uh, from some of the, the, the more recent work that we've done. But this tells you where we started, and this gives you an idea about what age that was. <laughs> who, who knows who that is? Keith George. It's true, he was slender and good looking at one time. It's not, it's not myth. It's not myth. Here is the proof of it. Well, what, what's great about this is that when, when we met uh, at Manchester Metropolitan, uh, and we spoke about this, and, and here, here were two, really two of the papers, and certainly two papers that I uh, first published, both in 1999. Uh, and the, the area that we were both interested in was the examination of the athlete's heart with echocardiography. The intriguing thing is in that time, is that the, at that time, echocardiography was like a snowstorm. When you took an echo of a heart, you were basically guessing what the shape of it was. It was incredible. Uh, what was interesting at that time, though, was there was a, 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 a seminal paper published in 1991 uh, by Antonio Pellicci, an Italian group, looking at a thousand athletes. Uh, and they predicted the upper limits of, of, the, of the wall thickness of the heart, uh, which actually stands to this day. So despite this poor technology, the quality of, of science at that time was, was still incredible. We, uh, we did some work later in the mid-90s, just recently after this, in the mid-90s in 500 athletes that showed exactly the same as Pelicia. And even now with the quality of echocardiography, in fact, cardiac MRI, which is much more accurate, uh, is that we know that, that our predictions at that time were just about right. Uh, so it, it's interesting how, although the technology has evolved, uh, science and thinking is, that, that, that hasn't in, in the sense of the results that we got from there. The other aspect of this was, one was this intriguing concept of, of what happens to the heart. What's the physiologic adaptation of the heart? But counter to that was this concept of whether there is a potential pathologic remodeling of the heart. And that uh, was work that both Keith and I did, but particularly with Sanjay Sharma, uh, and now more recently with the likes of John Samuru, who's here. Uh, cardiologists, unfortunately for them, uh, but uh, not real scientists, obviously, just traditions. Uh, but you know, we have to have them on the papers considering where we can get grants. Um, <laughs> but obviously what we're intrigued about is actually what happens, what happens to the heart in terms of the potential pathological remodeling. Interesting enough, more recently, this is just going out of chronology uh, to a sense, is that to, to recognize somebody else who's very important within this department, that's Danny Green, whose particular area of interest is vascular function, arterial function. Uh, and his team, which includes Dick Tyson, Ellen Dawson, and a number of others who are here in the audience, uh, have really advanced this concept of what goes on not only centrally, but peripherally. And also the, the concept of uh, nitric oxide endothelial function, and what's happening with the artery in Atlant. And we've recently, or we are about to publish a paper that looks at the differential, uh, differential between athletes and diseased individuals in peripheral artery function. So we, we've progressed a, a fair long way during that time, since 94, some 18 years worth of research. But what is it about? And, and I make no apologies for showing this, uh, despite my young children being here, they won't understand it, so that's fine. This is Mark Vivian Fowey, 2004 African Nations Cup. 
there are two things to think about here. Uh, this is, uh, they're, they're playing uh, in the African Nations Cup. This, this young man's an elite athlete. Uh, he was at West Ham, was signed to Man City, and was playing the African Nations Cup, and he, he falls down to Singapore uh, suddenly during a game. And we'll see that. Just take a look at the center circle. He's in motion, and unfortunately he dropped. Impact injury, he, had no, he, he made no attempt to actually stop his fall. Um, for this young man, as we see there, eyes roll back, last gasp, uh, he's in ventricular fibrillation. Uh, and every minute you don't defibrillate, he's got a 10% lower chance of survival. Uh, what's interesting here is that the medics, uh, these are trained medics, uh, come onto the pitch, they recognize he's not breathing, and they open an airway. Nobody feels for a pulse. They recognize that he is not breathing. It doesn't matter whether he can feel for a pulse or not. They recognize he's not breathing, they do not start CPR. There isn't an AED on pitch side, there isn't an AED in the ground. So there's no automated external defibrillator anywhere. 60,000 seat this down, 125 million pounds worth of players on the pitch and they don't have a 1,000 pound AED. That's what's gonna save this young man. Eventually they evacuate him off the pitch, it takes them five minutes, they get him to the sidelines. When they get him to the sidelines, somebody says, shall we start CPR? An official steps in and says, no, that'll look bad in front of the crowd. This young man died. Uh, eight minutes before they took him out of the stadium and they, they attempted the resuscitation at that time, by which time obviously he was already dead. He died of a particular disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. With an underlying disease, exercise is an incredibly potent stimulus to a pathologic response. And this is really what drove a great deal of our research, and it's probably the area within which I've spent most of my, my uh, career. Uh, and, and most of the sort of 100, 120 papers that we've published have been focused in this area. The concept of actually identifying what it is that causes sudden death in these young people. How can we identify them early? In other words, what's the value of pre-participation screening? And then what do we do with these young individuals if we do find them with disease? And it's driven us on a continual basis, and there's a huge amount of work in there. I'm not going to spend any more time on that, but suffice to say that it's probably the most important work that, that I do, uh, and with my colleagues, I think it's the area we've made the greatest uh, and most profound impact, particularly on, on, uh, on the, clinical, uh, the clinical world and the care of the athlete. Then it brings me into this, uh, and I put this up because the one thing that I want to recognise in, in this speech is that, and I'll finish on this, is the concept that no man is an island. This is about teamwork. Uh, and importantly in that teamwork is that for me, I've been incredibly lucky to have some incredible mentors uh, throughout, my, throughout my career. And it's actually those that really have, have been the bedrock of, of my understanding and my knowledge and, and if, effectively my career to point. This is a, a fantastic guy, Mark Harris, uh, Dr. Mark Harris, uh, along with Craig Sharp, who I'm going to mention in a second, that set up the British Olympic Medical Centre in 1986. He was a visionary. Uh, he realised that there was something lacking from the, the care and support of athletes. And so established with the British Olympic Association, the British Olympic Medical Centre. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to work with Mark uh, across a number of years. Uh, sadly, Mark died of cancer. Uh, but he was, a, he was a great guy and, a, and certainly a great mentor to me. Just the little one in the middle is Maya. <laughs> uh, so that gives you an idea about how long ago that is. Maya is now 26. <laughs> some of the books. Interesting enough, there's another book that, that's, that I published around about this time uh, called The Physiology of Training. I, I edited it. Uh, and, and again, I was lucky enough to work with real leaders in the field. And one of those guys is here tonight, and that's Don McLaren, uh, who was the series editor on that. And, and we are incredibly lucky to have been surrounded at this time by some of the true godfathers of sports science, not only UK, but actually globally, uh, and a real inspiration to us. And, and just on that point, it is, a, it is a good example. I put a horse up there, because I love horses. Don't you? Anyway, let's move on. Uh, what, this man taught me a number of different things. This is uh, one of my old girlfriends. I, thought, I, I told you it was chronological, so I thought I'd bring into play some personal things that happened to me. What, what, what's interesting about this, you, you probably, I don't know if you can see that paper, but this particular individual, I would say, is probably the most influential individual uh, in my career, and I'm absolutely delighted that he's here tonight, and that, that's Craig Sharp, Professor Craig Sharp, uh, who is, who is uh, 
an absolute leader, and with, without any shadow of doubt, along with one other individual, is probably the godfather of sports science in this country. But the one thing that he taught me, he came from a vet background. One thing he taught me is that, that actually it's not just about looking at the human. What you need to do is you need to extrapolate and look sideways and look outside of the box and actually look at this comparative physiology area. And it, 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 the sort of things that I learned from him was the fact that horses blood dope on the run. They release red blood cells from the spleen as they're running. An incredible thing to be able to do. Unfortunately, humans don't do it, or they do it to a very small margin. But what a great thing if we could do it, if we could transplant the spleen out of a horse into a human. You'd have a stomach about this big. You'd have lots of red blood cells, but you wouldn't be able to move, you'd topple over. But also areas like when we look at muscle mass, and increasing muscle mass, this is a Belgian blue, it's not my mild girlfriend. Uh, and what we see here is we see the suppression of the myostatin gene. Uh, and what that enables is this excessive muscle growth. And, and it, all of these things are, are incredibly interesting because what we can do is we can take those and put them into a, into a human model. And this paper, which you can't quite see, is just an incredible paper. And this, was, uh, this is the, the mark and the quality of Craig. Uh, Craig was the first person to document the top running speed of a cheetah. Uh, and this was the paper that was published some 20, probably two decades, maybe three decades after it was actually measured at 66 miles an hour. And if you get a chance, have a chat with Craig afterwards about how he did that. Uh, it's just truly inspirational. But it shows you sometimes, for me, is that, is that the people that are around us are often our greatest resource, and what we should be doing is tapping into them. Off the back of that, and, and, and uh, the backdrop of, of sudden cardiac death, uh, I was lucky enough to set up the Centre for Sports Cardiology, initially at the British Olympic Medical Centre. We've now got a new home in Harley Street, thanks to the guys at Harley Street who uh, allow us to reside there. But again, take a look at the team. The team is incredibly important. And this is another important guy to me. This is uh, Professor Bill McKenna, world's leading authority on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I, I was lucky enough to study under him. Uh, and, and a, a fantastic guy who now actually resides uh, at the Hart Hospital, just around the corner from Harley Street. It's a small world. But it, it shows you where we can take, it's not just about the research, it's actually about the application of that research, and this is where we took it. And certainly for me, this is my area of, of, of real interest, uh, and that is the area of integrated cardiopulmonary stress testing. Can we do that with athletes? Yes, we can. Invariably, we see what we normally see is on treadmill, Bruce protocol, but what we did when we were at the Olympic Medical Institute is we, ex we expanded that and we took a look at modality specific. And in fact, what we did, uh, along with some of my PhD guys, is we developed the ability to look at 12 lead ECG and gas analysis in water. So what we had swimmers, this, this shot here is the swimmer in a flume, it's an it's a endless pool. So as the flume is going along, they're swimming against it, they are static, but you can measure O2 and 12 lead ECG simultaneously. So it's that application for me, which is which is really the, probably the most important thing, or the most important area. Let's move away from the heart, and we'll recognise now another one of my PhD students. And this is Ricky Simpson. When I was at the British Olympic Medical Centre, one of the things that, that I learned is actually about being eclectic. It is a systems physiology approach. And Ricky Simpson was was one of those guys, an incredible guy. He's actually now a uh, professor uh, out at um, University of Texas, Houston. Uh, and his particular area of interest was immune function. Uh, and and this, is, this, is a, this is a great little slide, because what this shows is this uh, KLRG1, which is a cell surface receptor on the T lymphocyte, which, talks of, which effectively signals senescence. So if you take, if you take, uh, if you take a, a DNA strand, you have a telomere on the end of it. Once that telomere is reduced enough to what's called the high foot limit, it becomes senescent. So it's still functioning, but it won't replicate. Uh, and what, what we showed in this particular study really very nicely is that if you took male, if you, if you took elite runners uh, and you, you compared them against healthy controls, then effectively what you saw is that they had a huge increase in the number of senescent cells, 43% versus 76% on the right hand side of that slide. That, seven, that three quarters of T cells circulating, which are senescent, mm -hmm. is the same as smokers, alcoholics, and obese individuals. So here's a lovely example where what our assumption is that the elite sport is actually promoting health of the immune system. Uh, and we often talk about this thing that physical, people who are physically active have lower number of colds, they recover from colds much more rapidly. The fact is that actually if we take elite athletes, as you well know, most of them do wear girls' waxes, and they are constantly sick and they are always ill, and it always takes them a long time to recover from it. But there's a very good reason for that, and that is because this constant bombardment of the immune system 
from physical activity at very high levels actually causes a, an effective downregulation of the immune function. And so this cell senescence is, is a really interesting uh, piece of work. And, and uh, Ricky has got, has got on from there and is doing some really lovely work. And in fact, now is doing some work with NASA uh, looking at astronauts. Let's take a look at the lung. So we've gone heart, uh, we've gone immune system. Let's take a look at the lung. Uh, th this is a, a, a lovely one. And this, this is the mark of excellence. And this guy on the right hand side is X ray. Uh, this is uh, right hemisphere diaphragmatic paralysis uh, in an elite thrower. Uh, he came in uh, and couldn't breathe very well. Uh, we tested his lung function, his, his FVC was down by 50%. So effectively, he's working with one lung. Uh, I called in uh, Mark Harris, who came in, this is a true story, he, he walked in, he looked at him, he said, uh, when you're in the bath or when you swim, can you breathe? He said, no, I don't breathe very well at all. He said, lift your chest up, and he just tamponade, and he looked at me and said, right diaphragm paralysis, and walked out. He was literally in there for 30 seconds. Walked in, one question, one tap, walked out. Bang on. I'm, I'm incredible, and that for me is about you know, it's about using the quality that's around you. And so, off the back of that, we we, we did a whole host of work looking at diaphragm paralysis. Uh, again, we talk about our relationships with with other researchers, but we did a lot of work there with uh, Mike Corky down at uh, the Brompton, uh, and that looked at diaphragm function. It looked at, at respiration, and it actually led onto this new area. Uh, and, and there was a reason for this because this new area came up. Uh, in 2002, when the IOC uh, put short-acting beta-2 agonists, blue inhalers, uh, things like Benzley and the Salbutamol, put them onto the band list. Uh, and it was at that point I had a, what can only be the darkest day of my research career, uh, because I appointed John Dickinson. <laughs> Where is John? Oh, I can't get rid of that place. <laughs> Seriously. If he comes up and talks to you later, just we'll try and ignore him. <laughs> John is utterly remarkable. John actually uh, spent uh, three years doing his PhD with us. Uh, he, I then took him into the uh, English Institute of Sport, uh, and he's now a postdoc with us here. And he actually runs the, the three big WADA studies that we currently have running, looking at short-acting beta-2 agonists, which are pulling in somewhere in the region of about half a million pounds on those three projects alone. And John leads on that. And, and I think what, what the mark of this quality, the mark of, 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 of research, beta-2 agonists, and the only way that you can take them is if you do an EVH test and demonstrate efficacy. Well, at that time, there, was no, there were no commercially available EVH test kits, uh, and in fact, nobody knew how to do it. There was one paper from Sandy Anderson in the States, in Australia, who described what an EVH test kit looked like. And so what we did at the BOMC, again with a fantastic technician, uh, it, it was truly incredible. And remember, good research does not go on without good technicians. Uh, we actually pulled this piece of uh, kit together. Uh, and in this, in this particular test, what we do is we get athletes to, to hyperventilate 30 times FEV1 for six minutes of dry gas, which is, uh, which is an increase of 5% CO2 in it, so it stops them fainting, but is utterly miserable. And the fantastic thing about it is that you see the tube on expiration is that invariably fills up with sputum fully. Uh, that's why John is with us. Uh, and uh, he did a fantastic job of cleaning that tube out. Uh, and he's still, still with us, he's great. The speech of man. <laughs> but uh, uh, John really led the field in this, and now has actually become one of the world leaders uh, in, in uh, exercise induced asthma. Uh, and that's why we have the things like uh, the, uh, the WADA grants that we do and the work that's ongoing. But the key issue around this was the fact that what we found uh, and what the work was about was identifying the prevalence of exercise induced asthma. 20% of asthmatic, 20% uh, of Team GB that go to the Olympic Games are asthmatic. One fifth of Team GB. And in fact, if you dissect that down and take a look at individual squads, in some squads, there are over half the team that have asthma. Now, being asthmatic is not a prerequisite for being an elite athlete. So one of the key issues is that is exercise actually inducing asthma in these individuals? And there's some lovely work that John's done and others have done, which show that there is a potential but what you can do is you can develop asthma in athletes, particularly those that are competing in very cold, dry atmospheres, those being the winter Olympic athletes. So what we know then is actually that, that sport fundamentally, whilst we think it's probably good for the lungs, sport in fact may be detrimental to the lungs. 
And certainly we do know that if we if un left untreated and not treated well, we know that, that we'll become exacerbated and we see a downward spiral in that lung function. So far then, it may be bad for the heart, uh, it may be bad for the immune system, it may be bad for the lungs. So we're moving that way. And here's, a, here's some work that we did, and this is, I guess, to give an idea of what goes on in terms of the application. Uh, this is pre-2004, this is Athens, one of the most polluted places on, on the planet. The great thing about the IOC is what they do, when you, when you bid for an Olympic Games, if you are very, very polluted you're in a, with a child. <laughs> So that's why we've had Los Angeles, and that's why we've had Athens, uh, and that is likely why we had the waste grounds of East London, uh, which they couldn't build on for about six years until they got rid of the contaminated waste. But it, it shows you the, the key problem we've got. So in somewhere like Athens, the, the, the topography of the place is, is of, of interest. What it means is we, 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 we get these very low levels of high pollution. Uh, this just gives you some idea about, again, what we're working with. We spoke about nature in terms of publications in nature. Take a look now at the government publications. You can't always believe it. The, the solid lines are those uh, which are the uh, pollution, this is ozone, uh, in those various regions around the Olympic uh, area. Uh, the, the solid black line going across is the WHO upper limit guidelines for ozone. And what you see is that basically Athens is above that upper, upper uh, guideline on a regular basis. So in 1999, IFC step in and say, right, Athens, Greece, unless you bring the pollution down, you won't be hosting the Olympic Games. So what we move from is the dotted lines, the dotted black line, to the solid black line. So effectively what we do is we move from lots of pollution to virtually zero pollution in a single year without doing anything to industry. Very impressive, is all I can say. I hope we're able to do that elsewhere. But what, what, that, what, that, what that strikes really is what we know is that, 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 uh, that pollution impacts on lung function, impacts negatively on performance, and so therefore doing something about it is important. And one of the things about this applied research area is actually going out to Athens. Uh, me and John, again, not Nicholson, I told you I couldn't get rid of him. I went out there and measured these uh, pollution levels uh, in, in specific science around Athens uh, and identified the fact that actually there were very high levels of ozone. And so therefore that led to the development of strategies for Team GB in 2004 to try and ameliorate uh, the impact of those, uh, those areas. I put this up, not because I like naked men, I'm not against it, obviously. Uh, but this is another one of my PhD students, Charlie Pedler. Where's Charlie? Charlie in the front, and we'll just mention Charlie in a second. Uh, but this does show you that sometimes if you are one of my PhD students, you will be forced to do something very silly. Uh, there was no reason to put a mask on his face in this. Uh, we're just doing it for fun. <laughs> Association. Pro boxing, uh, it, the incidence of head injury is very high, uh, particularly at the after fight conference. If you saw it, <laughs> I actually think they had in, head injury before they started fighting. I'm not sure about that, but uh, head injury in the likes of uh, things like um, horse racing is obviously massive. Uh, and, and this lower left one is a, a good friend of mine, it's a guy that we look after, this is James Cranmer. Uh, and I don't know if you heard, but he had uh, masses of subdural hematoma, massive subdural hema, uh, when he was out cycling. Uh, he got hit by a truck, moving at 70 miles an hour, the wing mirror just clipped the back of his head uh, in Arizona. Uh, and he, he, he suffered a major blow to that. I guess the backdrop of this is that, that understanding, that this is where you know, the background of the people that you know is really important, understanding what subdural hematoma is, what its impact is on function, not only in terms of, of uh, personality function, but actually in terms of cognitive function, uh, is it gives you a huge amount of information. And just above it, that's uh, that is crackers on ice. Uh, and and uh, I looked after James after his subdural hematoma. We we took care of his rehabilitation. And only six months later, from a life-threatening injury, which he spent seven days in intensive care, intubated, uh, he actually went to um, the Yukon and did a 400-kilometer non-stop mountain bike race in minus 30 degrees centigrade. 
yes, he is an utter nutter. <laughs> so that, that goes without saying. But there's no doubt about it, the head injury is, is a real problem when it comes to sport. The intriguing thing is that this was a paper that we published with uh, Mike Loosemore. Uh, and, and this was, I, the intriguing thing about this is that the BMJ actually published this. The BMJ has waged a war against boxing since its inception. It, uh, it, it's, it vilifies boxing on a regular basis and basically promotes the fact that we shouldn't box. And what we did is we went back and took a look at, uh, look at the, the papers that had been published, the systematic review uh, of all the observational studies, and effectively demonstrated that amateur boxing, there is no evidence whatsoever for head injury in amateur boxing. Uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting one for me because I think research is about that, because often what we have is that we, we, we have this scientific dogma, is that we get to a point in life where we believe what people tell us. And actually, when you go back and look at the data, when you go back and look at the papers, what you realize is it's fabricated. It doesn't truly exist. And so th the point was that Mike had spent somewhere in the region of about 15 years in boxing and had never seen a single uh, head injury in an amateur boxer. And, and his question was, is, is it, does it really cause head injury? So what we did is we went back and took a look. And here we are. This is a really nice example of never believe what you read. Just because it's in the paper doesn't make it true. And I think that, that was a great, a, a great moment for us when, when we published that. But let's take a look at the, the, the other end of the spectrum. So we're looking at, we've looked at the brain, but let's take a look at the whole body, the system as itself. See you, Mitch. See you guys. <laughs> they do it to home. I'm surprised they're lasting so long. Frankly. You all right, huh? She's tough. <laughs> Much like this kid here. This is the Hawaii Ironman in 1997. Uh, he has swum 4.2 kilometers, cycled 180 kilometers, and has run 26 miles. He's only got 0.2 of a mile to go, and he cannot finish. He has pushed himself to the absolute limit. Often people say to me, well, you know, sport and exercise, same thing, isn't it? Absolutely not, because what we know is that with sport, you would never find, you would never find an obese middle-aged woman at your local gym doing that to herself. It looks like that. <laughs> but they're not pushing themselves to the limit. What this, what this guy is doing is pushing himself to the limit. How do we know that? Because we know that following this, he's unable to finish. This guy is the, one of the best Ironman triathletes in the world. This is not a novice. Uh, he's on for a sub eight hour Ironman. Truly amazing. How do we know that he's pushing himself to the limit? Because during this event, he got ischemic bowel and had to have a colonectomy. And a significant portion of his colon was removed. And he never returned to international sport. That's how far these guys will push themselves. They will drive themselves to the absolute limit. And remember, this is one race. He is doing this every day of his life, in training, in racing, on a regular basis. And the key question is, is, is that really good for you? Is that really good for the system? I have to caveat that, obviously. Uh, there is a caveat to that, and this is Eddie. Everyone remembers Eddie? Uh, 43 marathons in 51 days. Uh, phenomenal. A real character, an incredibly, uh, uh, just a great guy. The, the story for this was he phoned up one morning. He said, Greg, I've got this great idea. He said, I'm going to run around the UK. So I then explained to him that if you ran around the UK, it's actually three and a half thousand miles. So I said to him, you're not going to run around the UK. He said, no, I'm not going to run around the UK. I said, Look, let, let's get together. Let's have breakfast and we'll talk about what, you know, what potentially we could do. So we did that. And when we sat down, I said to him, so Eddie, how much running have you done? None. I said, yeah, seriously, how much running? He said, no, I've done none. He said, no, that's a lie. He said, I've done one run. He said, I woke up last week, and this is what, what started off. He woke up last week. Uh, he was staying in central London, and he, he had a meeting in Bray, which is not far from where I live. It's 22 miles from central London. And he thought to himself, I'll run it. <laughs> <laughs> so he ran it. So it's a little bit nothing, obviously. Uh, but it, it, interestingly on that is that he... he Ran the 22 miles, it took him eight hours. So obviously he didn't run the whole thing. Uh, but it took him eight hours to get there. And the way that he hydrated and fed himself was to stop at corner shops for Kilipos. <laughs> and that's absolutely true. Because the first meeting we had, he said to me, do you think we can get Wolves as a sponsor? <laughs> I'm like, seriously, we're not gonna be able to do 43 marathons on Kilipos. <laughs> well, I'd like to try, but I don't think it's possible. What, I, I think what, what, this, what this demonstrates though is often people say, what do you do for these guys? And obviously there is the, the training element to it. It's, it's, it's about making them physically able to do these particular challenges. But the, probably the, the critical area that I work with these guys on is actually limiting the damage that they do to themselves. 
These events are incredibly damaging physiologically and psychologically. And what really my job is to do is actually limit that as much as we possibly can. And so the sort of things that we do is we take a look at hydration. How can we hydrate these guys to reduce the potential for dehydration, hypothermia, uh, heat injury, and heat stroke? It's a real issue in, in, in these guys. How do we reduce muscle damage? Post-exercise icing, the use of antioxidant supplementation, compression, all of those things. It's the worst thing. He hated getting into the ice. He said he would rather run another marathon than get into the ice bath. But it was always fun for him in a minute. And then obviously the damage that he did to his feet. His feet looked dreadful. But actually, to be honest with you, for an ultra endurance runner, they were in pretty good shape without any shadow of a doubt. And, and also that concept of solitude and, and dealing with solitude, uh, amongst other things. How do you cope with that? And so when we talk about is sport good for you, the bottom line is actually sport per se, <laughs> what we are trying to do as sports science and sports medicine is delimit those things that are actually going to cause damage. Now, if we do it well, then we do it successfully. Uh, and that, that was a great day, really. Uh, the interesting thing for anyone, I mean, uh, how, how do you measure success? I, I measure success differently to, to what these guys do. But he wanted to deliver his fastest marathon on the final marathon, his 43rd marathon. Uh, and, and we managed to do that. He ran five hours and two minutes. The target was sub five hours. He would have gone 4.45, but the rickshaw, which has got the film crew, so it's got a cameraman, a sound man, and a producer in the back of this rickshaw, with this one guy, Swampy, we called him. Uh, he was a funny looking bloke. He had actually cycled a thousand miles. He, he, he got no adulation at all. Incredible guy. He had actually cycled the whole way. And it was only five miles from the finish when the back axle broke with the weight of this film crew, who had been getting larger and larger over this 51 day period. But he would have gone sub five hours in that final marathon. An, an incredible feat, absolutely incredible for a guy that had never run before. But born of the fact that what we are doing is limiting the damage that's being done by, by sport. I'm going to move on to environment, and I think it's a really poignant time to, to put these two up. Uh, in 2004, uh, I, I spent a lot of time with, with the late Tom Riley. Uh, and a, a, a nicer guy you'd never meet, uh, a more intelligent guy, you know, you, you would struggle to meet. Just a, just a great guy. Uh, and in 2004, uh, when I was at the Olympic Medical Institute, we wrote a special edition of the JSS on environment. Uh, and Tom and I wrote the editorial for that. Uh, and, and we published a number of things over that time, but this one paper is particularly memorable for me because it's one of the last papers that Tom ever wrote. Uh, and this was published in 2008. Uh, and this was a, a special edition again of the JSS uh, where we wrote the, the piece on specificity. Uh, and, and Tom is named appropriately for the Tom Riley building, but his, his, uh, his presence and his influence both in this university, nationally and importantly internationally, is incredible. It's absolutely powerful. Uh, and he certainly was a, a, a very important part of my career uh, and certainly my knowledge and expertise to this day. We, had, we shared a love for the environment, uh, and particularly we shared a love for this concept of heat and, and the impact of heat. Uh, and uh, Tom and I were at this uh, particular event when uh, Radcliffe fell. Interesting enough, Radcliffe fell for one particular reason. She was injured prior to the games, uh, and her medics were giving her high dose non steroidal anti inflammatories. If you give somebody high dose non steroidal anti inflammatories, it impacts on the gut and also impacts on water retention. So it reduces. Uh, glucose uptake of the gut, it increases uh, retention of fluid. So basically what she was, was uh, glycogen depleted and overweight when she started that run. And it really isn't a wonder that she became hypothermic and had to stop at 20 miles. I, I was right next to her on, on, the, on the road. It was brutal, 50 degrees centigrade was the, the tarmac temperature. And the heat was absolutely unbearable. Not a place to be if you are hypohydrated. But, but it, it led us to believe that, again, that sport in this environment can be incredibly damaging, even to the best. And this was the uh, most recent highlight of mine. I was the uh, science advisor to the uh, Commonwealth Games in, um, in India this year, uh, two years ago, last year, wasn't it? <laughs> two years ago. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was fun. It was, it was a very interesting environment to be, very hot, very polluted. But probably the best memory I have of that particular day was about the dengue fever. I landed in India when this issue of dengue fever hit up. And I got a copy of the Times that day. And I was utterly reassured by this piece because I knew that I was in safe hands. Because what happened was that they had appointed a minister to 
take control of the cleanup process. <laughs> Are you serious? Sheila Dixon <laughs> is, is in charge of the cleanup. Right. That cannot be right, can it? So it gave us much analogy. Fortunately, I came back without dengue fever, so that was a bonus. Let's move on to the cold. Everybody knows Dave. Uh, and Dave Williams, who's a very close family friend of, of, of ours now. Uh, this was back in 2005 into 2006 when, when I uh, coached him to swim the channel. Uh, and, and the interesting thing about the channel was is that often the environment can belie the, the true dangers that exist within some of these environments. The, the English Channel is incredibly cold. I mean, apart from it being the busiest shipping lane in the world, apart from it having very fast currents, being effectively zero visibility, high salinity, the bottom line is that its peak in the summer it hits 17 degrees centigrade. Survival time is about two and a half hours at best. You have to keep moving in order to abate the cold. And so it's absolutely crucial that one of the things that we understand, and again this is the application of science and the application of research, is how we can avoid that. Because with that cold comes shivering thermogenesis, it becomes a, a glycogen depleted state much more rapidly. You actually dehydrate much more rapidly in cold environments. So actually combating that is really very important. And there are a number of ways that we did it. A few of them were my favorite ways, but there was one particular way that what we did is we stopped the cold impacting on David. Uh, and we used to spend weekends, uh, most weekends, practicing this. Uh, and that was greasing up. Now, he used to do it to me occasionally. It's good to understand more how it goes on. Uh, just to, just to, to put you, your mind at rest, the greasing makes absolutely no difference to the, the, the thermoregulation of water at all. The reason why you wear it is because there are points when you're swimming across the channel where you have jellyfish pods, which are about a mile wide. And you don't get the option to swim around them, you have to swim directly through them. And that, 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 that grease that we put on, which is lanolin and, and, uh, and Vaseline combined, is effectively to stop the stings on your body. The last thing you want to do, and actually about three weeks before we swam, somebody did it, uh, is they actually took a jellyfish in the mouth, uh, stung the back of their throat and had to get airlifted out. So keep your mouth shut, not only for jellyfish, frankly, but when you leave this channel, there are other reasons to keep it closed. But the cold can have a profound effect, and here's a very good example of The water it. temperature here at Eaton's Rowing Lake is 16 degrees, slightly warmer than the channel will be for David's attempt. Hey, yeah, good. You ready to run? Yeah. <laughs> we're going to be there a while, so... Oh, my God. Well, there you go. How is it? Is it nice? Water causes David to hyperventilate. Although it looks funny, if he does this in the channel, he'll breathe in water and could drown. 80% of the open water deaths occur because of the cold shock response. It's a serious issue. Uh, it, it was even funnier there, though, because the, the, the film crew on the side, which included the guys from Comic Relief, when he started to hyperventilate, they thought it was really funny. When he continued to hyperventilate, they actually thought he was going to die. And you could see their face move from hilarity utter shock of mitigation of uh, 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 A-list celebrity dying in the water as they filmed it. It's an interesting one that, that in essence, in that type of environment, actually you're going to, you, you will call very, very rapidly, but invariably you can get taken out. What happens in these type of environments, here's a guy that I work with, and this, this uh, was one of the Guinness Book of World Records, it's the coldest marathon ever run. Uh, it wasn't anywhere exciting like Antarctica. This was in a cold freezer, uh, Sainsbury's Depot in Denham. Beautiful. Great part of the world. But he actually ran a marathon of minus 43 degrees centigrade. Uh, what I love about this is actually how we make this happen. One of the things that, all, all, what am I interested in? Fundamentally, I'm interested in one thing, and that is I'm interested in frostbite. What's going on in the periphery, particularly the, the, the fingers, nose, uh, for men, 
the tackle and, and the toes. That's really the critical area that, that, that really interests us. One of the other complications, you see this heat lamp. This heat lamp is not for me. Uh, I wish it was. And it certainly wasn't for Noel when he was running. This was actually so that the machine would work. This is so that the, the, the HP Cosmos treadmill would actually work at these temperatures. We had to heat it up because it wouldn't function under minus four, three degrees centigrade. If you get it wrong in this environment, if you get it wrong, and you only have to get it wrong for a very short period of time, if you get it wrong, that's the result. So when we say that sport is bad for you, this is the type of thing that when you have a three and a half minute exposure into the wind, and it is a little tip for you, next time it's very cold, if you are going to men in particular, probably just men, if you are going to urinate, make sure you do it away from the wind. When they talk about doing it into the wind, there's a good reason for that, because skin temperature drops very, very rapidly. Three and a half minutes exposure, no digits left. Uh, I recently worked with Helen Skelton uh, on the Antarctic expedition and he saw bits of it. Uh, one of the teams there uh, made that same mistake, lost three fingers. So it happens on a regular basis. And it is, it is a major problem. But this gives you a good demonstration of the sport probably is bad for you. But fingers are one thing. But take a look at this. That shows you what can happen. Uh, that's interesting. That was a show that I worked on for the BBC. Uh, it was called The Challenge. And for that guy, it particularly was a challenge. What was interesting was that there was the, it gives you a good demonstration about when you give instruction to people, particularly athletes, invariably they don't listen to them. And that's why you have to keep telling them on a continual basis. It's virtually impossible to give an athlete an instruction they will follow. And that's why you have to give repetition. Uh, what, what happened to him there? He basically got up in the morning. He looked out the door and he thought, oh, that's not that cold. So he didn't bother putting his thermal underwear on. He's wishing he did now, let me tell you. So it gives a good example about where sport and exercise, the edges, really do blur in terms of whether it's good or bad. These are the guys I took up Kilimanjaro. I'm sure you, you, you know most of those. Uh, it, was, it was a great experience, but it was an interesting one because one of those things that, that the concept came in. It was Gary Barlow's idea. Gary called me up and said, look, this is what we're going to do. I'm just going to take a group of my mates and we're going to go up and help. And the idea is that we can go to extreme altitude without any problem at all. Uh, and, and it's an interesting one because actually going to extreme altitude is equally problematic. And that's why we spend a huge amount of time. Uh, and, and this is some great work from Charlie Pedler. Where's Charlie? Charlie's here. There he is. Great work from Charlie, uh, who was a PhD of mine at, at the Olympic Medical Institute, then went on the English Institute of Sport, and is now at St. Mary's. Uh, and it's, it's a, a fantastic area where we began to look at what really happens when you go to altitude. And this was one of the, the, uh, the studies that, that Charlie did, and that was to look after the acclimatization strategy for Salt Lake City for the, for the biathlon squad. And off the back of that, some of the areas that we did look at was looking at this uh, acute response to sleep. And what we do know is that there's a huge amount of sleep disruption at altitude. We used a whole variety of different people to do this work. And one of our subjects was Rob Schaefer. Uh, and here is a guy, when you talk about sleep apnea, it, sleep apnea was a period of 30 seconds where you don't breathe. Uh, Rob had a period of about eight hours where he didn't breathe. <laughs> Incredible when you looked at him in the morning from a hypoxic response. He was better looking, granted. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, it does show you the dangers of going to these type, type of environments. I'll put these up uh, because, again, what I wanted to just uh, talk back to is the fact that this is about teamwork. So Charlie there, we see Richard Godfrey. Richard was the chief medical officer, uh, chief physiologist for the British Olympic Medical Center for 12 years. 
now at Brunel. Uh, he did his PhD, we did his PhD together uh, in growth hormone uh, and did some fantastic studies, some really nice studies. John Buckley is in here. I uh, did a, a wonderful study looking at growth hormone response and lactate response in the carnivores patients. Uh, and and it, it was a, a very interesting uh, area of work, which again, was a little bit outside the box, but had a big relationship with muscle mass and, and, uh, and lactate response to exercise in elite athletes. On the left hand side, Andy, where's Andy? Professor Andy Lane, he's a psychologist. Effectively, that's another word for unexplained physiology. Uh, and I, I put down there, you probably can't quite see it, but this was me becoming a psychologist. I am now a psychologist because we looked at mood states in dancers. Oh, yes, I am the man when it comes to mood states in dancers, let me tell you. Thanks for putting my name on that, Andy. I've never lived it down, frankly. It wasn't, it wasn't the benefit. But Andy was an incredibly important part of this team. And this team, when we think about it, this is about multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary approach. And it's absolutely fundamental that. None of this work goes on in isolation. This is all about teamwork. The key issue is that sometimes things can go wrong. This is where sport can be innately evil. Can you explain teamwork? I mean, if I look at this, it's Again, just give you a start of a reminder that sport is innately evil. I mean, there is a key issue around this. It was interesting when we climbed Kilimanjaro, we came across an individual uh, who, with his mate, had decided to climb Kili on his own. Uh, we saw him at about four and a half thousand meters. They didn't have a medic with him. Luckily, we did. Uh, but this young man who we found, found, and he was on the ground, prostate, uh, with uh, uh, hape, probably bordering on haste, uh, luckily was saved. His life was saved. Had, it, had we had come across him about an hour later, he would have been dead. And that, that's the, the key issue around some of these environments. And in fact, you don't even have to go to extreme altitude to see this. But it does show you that, that much of what our work is is actually trying to reduce or limit some of the key issues about going to some of these environments. Let's just finish on, on this, this area, really, because this is probably the, 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 the new stuff. It's Wendy Ingram. And I'll put these on because uh, Andy Lane, who I've just alluded to, he's a, he's a big runner. He, was, he actually coached this young lady here, you're about to see it come in. Uh, so one, next one in, coached by Andy Lane. Uh, only from a technical perspective. <laughs> uh, uh, this is the same Ironman. This is the same Ironman. 1997 was a pretty hot day in, in the brutal environment. This is third and fourth place. So these are not backtracking. This is the third and fourth place as they come across the line. And it shows you that. What we're going to do is take a look at the Brazilian who comes past him. This is the differential response that sport can have. He comes in, he's actually caught with him up, he's a little star ahead of him. And the question is, do athletes push themselves to the absolute limit? Here's a fantastic example, in my opinion, of athletes who push themselves to the limit. They have no time. Oh yes, she will crawl across the line to get third place at the World Championships. But invariably what happens here is that the, Tragically, the girl who finished in fourth place here uh, received such bad healing that she never returned to international competition. Athletes push themselves to the limit. And the question is, what impact does that have? We've already taken a look at the impact that it has on the immune function, on the lung, uh, on, on the brain. Globally, sport is innately problematic. And, and this really led us to, to some of this early work. And again, this was, uh, this was Keith in the very early days. Uh, back in the 90s, seems like such a long time ago, but looking at this concept of exercise-induced cardiac dysfunction and, and stroke fatigue, 
stroke exercise induced release of cardiac troponins. This, 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 I, this idea that the heart would be damaged. I'd just like to pay homage at this point because at that point we picked up two PhD students, in some of our earliest PhD students. That was Ellen Dawson, who's number one, and she's now here as a postdoc at Liverpool John Moore. And the other is Rob Shea. Rob is now a professor down at, uh, at UIC or uh, Wales Met. I can never remember what the name of the college was. Cardiff Met, there you go. Uh, and, this, and Rob obviously now has his own PhD students. This is one of his PhD students taking an echocardiogram on Rob. <laughs> uh, those of you who have seen Rob naked will know that he actually does look like that. It's incredible. But what, what's great about that is that since, since that first paper in, uh, in 2000, uh, we've published as a group, and again, think about this as teamwork, a huge amount of work demonstrating that actually when we undertake arduous exercise, there is a release of cardiac components which may be associated with cardiac damage. There is a dysfunction that's associated with that as well. Uh, and, and so, off the back of that, our idea came to cycling, ultra endurance cycling. And this is the guys we took on the million pound cycle. Um, I won't spend a great deal of time on that, only to say that one of the things that we did is we took a look at this race. Um, five minutes to see it. Uh, another of my team members on this crazy race, the race across America. And for me, this is where applied meets research. Uh, because on this particular project, uh, on this particular race, we, we had three PhD students. Karen is in here. Where's Karen? Aaron and Andrew Holton is in here as well. Yeah, he's in there somewhere. Uh, and there was three projects ongoing, taking a look at various different things. But Karen was, was effectively running on the work that we've done on cardiac fatigue. Just to give you some idea about how arduous some of these things are, this is sport versus exercise. This is what sport is about. This is a non stop race from San Diego, from Oceanside in, in California, to Annapolis in Maryland. 3,100 miles non stop. As a team of four, uh, it took us six days, 10 hours and 51 minutes of non-stop exercise to get there. That's not moderate intensity, moderate duration of exercise. That is non-stop exercise for that duration of time. There's a whole host of issues that go along as well. Across the Mojave Desert, it was at 45 degrees centigrade. When we raised up into the, uh, into the, the high mountains, we went down to minus five degrees centigrade. And there's a whole host of issues around health, both in terms of hydration, in terms of nutrition, but also in terms of actual health. Karen's fantastic on this because she was in charge of Kit. Uh, and her novel interpretation of drying Kit was to actually put Kit into the microwave. And she tried to dry a Kit in the microwave with metal zips on it. <laughs> uh, fortunately, she doesn't own any pets, otherwise I'm sure they <laughs> But she published a great paper on the back of that. But because of that, it meant we had to reuse Kit on a regular basis. It wasn't dry. And if you, if you wear, if you don't wear dry Kit, particularly dry shorts, there are all sorts of problems that this can create for you. I'm just going to flash this up once, and this is just to say that when you are part of a team on an ultra endurance race, occasionally there are jobs that you really don't want to do. So off the back of that, that led us into some of this work, and this was the concept of whether exercise can actually cause damage to the heart. Can it cause what we see here? And this is a, this is a case study that, that we published uh, some time ago. Uh, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which actually showed diffuse fibrosis in, in both left and right uh, ventricles of this young man, a 43-year-old, who died suddenly during the London Marathon. Uh, he was otherwise well. He, we screened his entire family, and his entire family were well. He didn't have those diseases which are associated with cardiac hypertrophy and interstitial fibrosis. And so our, our suggestion at that point was that actually exercise may be the factor which is causing damage to the heart. Off the back of that is another one of my PhD students. I thank Andy Lane for this, because Andy actually pulled this, uh, this uh, particular picture together for us. Uh, Matt Wilson uh, just finished his uh, PhD about two years ago with us. Uh, he's now the head of uh, <coughs> the Qatar, uh, ASPATAR, the National Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Hospital in Qatar. So it, it's great to see some of these guys go to incredibly uh, prestigious places. Uh, and Matt has continued his work, and we enveloped that work into cardiac MRI studies. Uh, and, and it came down to this one particular paper on the right, and this is the recent editorial, in fact, this is the most recent BJSM and editorial we've just written, uh, which actually shows that if you take ultra-endurance exercises, ultra-endurance elite athletes, and you take a look at their heart, there is interstitial fibrosis, which suggests that there is damage, which is likely to be caused by exercise. 
So one of our current thinkings is that actually exercise is damaging for the heart. So all told, really, what we've shown there is that exercise per se is beneficial without any shadow of a doubt, but sport itself exists in a different genre, it exists on a different part of this dose-dependent response relationship. And there is a key potential here that sport itself can be the main evil. I'll just put this up because I'm just going to finish on here if I may. And, and this is just probably one of my favourite pictures. And, and this is David Whaley swimming across the channel. Uh, this is the boat and this is David. You can just see the white dot flashing across. In, in research, in our lives in research, often we don't, can't remember how we got to where we are. We can't remember where we came from. And invariably you can't see where you're going to. But I think that's an important thing to remember is that when you are there, you're never alone. And this life, whether it be research or just standard life, whether it be sport life, is about teamwork and it's about the team that surrounds you. And invariably it's the team that gets you along as well as your own personal endeavour. So the one thing that I would like to do is actually thank the team. I think I've thanked quite a few of you, and there's plenty that I haven't mentioned, who have been part of, of my research career. Uh, but there are two people in particular. Uh, and, and really the, the reason I am here is, one is, is uh, my, my surrogate mother, uh, and that is <laughs> Professor Tim Cable. And, it, it, and his, his running of this department is exceptional, truly exceptional. And the reason why this department is one of the world leaders, particularly in cardiovascular uh, physiology, but importantly in sports science, not only nationally, but actually globally, uh, is, is very much down to Tim and the incredible work that he does. Of course, there's Mummy, and what we do need is we need Debbie Bear. Uh, and <laughs> guess which one keep is? It's a tricky one, I know. Uh, but uh, he's had a few beers, he actually thinks he's bald. <laughs> uh, I want to thank Keith, because actually, uh, you know, this has been a union between me and Keith. He tried to get rid of this since 1994, and he's never managed it. Uh, and we've been together since then, and, and without any shadow of doubt, his leadership in Risings here at this institution is incredible, and it's the reason why we continue to move on an upward path uh, when it comes to research. I'd also like to thank, obviously, that there are a number of key people that are close to me. My mum and dad are here, uh, and without my mum and dad, I wouldn't have achieved anything that I have done up to this point, and they've been incredibly important, uh, both from a personal perspective, but also from a sporting and career perspective. And so I'd definitely like to thank them for everything they've done for me. And then finally, I would like to thank my wife. She met me some time ago, and she was fallen over by my devastating good looks. Uh, and it, was, it must have been the personality, frankly, why she came to me. But since that time, we've been incredibly lucky, and you've probably heard them. <laughs> but my beautiful girls, Mary and Elise, say hi. Mary and Elise. <laughs> And of course, most recently of all, and that is the Mighty Mitchell. And that t-shirt probably does encapsulate it. I am incredibly lucky. And I'm lucky both to have an incredible family around me, uh, incredible friends, incredible colleagues, and to be here at Liverpool John Moores University doing what I do. And to that end, I thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.